when the mighty and wicked wizard known as the Demon King comes face to face with a young lady scorned by society for her refusal to marry, he decides to offer her a spot in his mansion and teach her the joys of living life not giving a hoot about what others think. Our story kicks off with a golden-haired gal making a mad dash from a bunch of guards hellbent on capturing her at all costs. The chase is long and exhausting, her face grimy from dirt and sweat. She bolts into the forest without a second thought, hoping to lose the guards. These cowards decide not to enter the forest, fearing the demon that resides within. A demon who despises humans and would munch on their bones should they dare step into his forestly abode. Believing they've seen the last of her, the guards take off, leaving the forest behind. The girl, still on edge despite shaking off the guards, decides to push further into the forest. Feeling guilty, she apologizes to someone named Natalia for bailing without a word. In her flight, the girl trips over a rock and hits the deck, knocked out cold. Yet, before blacking out, she spots a solitary mansion with lights aglow in the distance. The next morning, the mansion's owner, a dude with half-white, half-black hair, reads in the paper about the harpy from the neighboring country making a break for it. Some even believe she's fled abroad. Feeling something fishy, he heads into the forest, hoping for a monster showdown. But what he finds is far from a monster. There lies the runaway, still out cold, surrounded by curious critters. As the guy approaches, the animals bolt, and he scoops the girl into his arms. He figures she's more of an escapee than a criminal. Even with the girl in tow, he teleports behind a guard lurking around, hoping to ambush the girl. The guard makes a move, but our guy teleports with a swift dodge, using illusion magic, clearly outclassing the guard. Up close, the guy realizes he's facing the royal family's personal guard. Suddenly, they're surrounded by a horde of guards, swords at the ready. The lead guard insists on handing over the girl, claiming she's a criminal who's dishonored the nation. Hand her over peacefully, and they'll let him walk free. Eyeballing the frail, unconscious girl, he can't fathom her being a criminal. Plus, the guard's shady and threatening vibe doesn't sit well with him, so he opts to defend the girl and confront the men. The guards launch a simultaneous sword attack, aiming to take him down without a fuss, but our guy, without even chanting spells, uses a power that freezes the guards' lower limbs, rendering them unable to fight. Realizing the extent of his power, and noting his white and black hair, the lead guard figures they're up against the demon of the forest. Using a new power, he brainwashes all the guards into believing they lost the girl's trail in the forest, convincing them she was gobbled up by some beast. Glad to get rid of the guards once and for all, the demon, using the same power, sends them packing back to the castle with their revised story. Situation handled, the demon heads back to his mansion with the girl in arms, laying her down to rest until she comes to. When the girl wakes up, the demon hands her a cup of some recovery brew and lets on that he knows she's Charlotte Evans, the betrothed of the second prince of Nera's kingdom, since he's got the paper with all the deets. Charlotte, through tears, tries to set the record straight, and the demon figures she's telling the truth just by looking into her eyes. It's the first time anyone's believed her, and she proceeds to spill the beans on why she was exiled from the kingdom. At a grand party, the prince she was engaged to calls her out in front of all the guests. She steps up, amid the swirl of rumors, but didn't see what was coming. The prince declares all her misdeeds have come to light, listing a bunch of lies about her actions, concluding she'll be jailed for treason. With a wicked grin, the prince sends guards to lock her up. Charlotte, in tears, protests her innocence, but no one dares question the prince's word. Then she escapes from prison, details sketchy, ending up in the forest, basically betrayed. Charlotte finishes her tale and thanks the demon for his help but insists she'll leave right away to avoid further trouble. However, the demon inquires if she's good with cleaning, ignoring her earlier statement. When she confirms she is, he decides to hire her as his housekeeper so she can stay in the mansion with a salary and three meals a day. Better deal than many of us get. Charlotte queries why he'd shelter a criminal wanted by the royalty, and the demon explains he was betrayed in the past, so now he wants to help her. He then introduces himself as Alan Crawford and shares his story. Three years back, a group of adventurers invited Alan for some fun and games. Thinking it'd be a blast, Alan joined in. However, 
they used him to break a temple seal, looted the treasure, and left him to die at the hands of monsters. Hearing her savior's story, Charlotte saddened and can't fathom people being so wicked to abandon a buddy. Alan's surprised she's naive enough to buy the story he just cooked up. Still, Charlotte insists on not wanting to stay just to cause him trouble. Alan then claims he's just cursed himself with a deadly spell that'll stop his heart in three minutes unless Charlotte agrees to be his housekeeper. So, after a bit of manipulation and playing on the poor girl's innocence, Alan convinces Charlotte to work for him and stay in the mansion. The next day, the house sparkles after Charlotte gets cracking on her chores. Alan, eyeing her hands for the first time, figures Charlotte's noble title was just for show, as the roughness of her hands showed she was treated more like a servant at the prince's place. Seeing the house clean, Alan gives Charlotte the rest of the day off to do as she pleases. Charlotte asks if he's not worried she'll steal, but he mentions spending all his money on stuff for her to live comfortably, apologizing again. In the vast library, Alan tells his employee she's now on the clock, so she can do anything but bother him. Truth is, the guy can't stand to leave someone in trouble but really hates socializing. Well, guess that's why he lives in a mansion in the middle of the woods. After shooing the girl away, he dives into his sole hobby, debunking a recently published magical theory with his corrections. At academic conferences, they call him the red ink demon because that's the color he uses for all his annotations. At the evening, Alan realizes he needs to light up the place, only to find Charlotte on the floor. Startled, he asks what she's up to, and she says she was counting the wood grains on the floor. Worried because no sane person does that, Alan inquires about her hobbies and what she did in her free time at the castle. Charlotte shares she had no free time, always stuck in wedding rehearsals, cleaning, or mending clothes. Trying to steer the chat elsewhere, Alan asks if she has any happy memories, and Charlotte lights up, recalling a time her sister, Natalia, gave her a fruit. It was a bit old, but the memory of her sister giving her that fruit makes her very happy. Horrified that a young girl has never had free time, hobbies, or fun, Alan decides to show her the world's whims, aka, the frown upon pleasures. The next day, the dude sells his magic gear to go on a massive shopping spree for Charlotte. Starting off easy to not freak her out, he begins with a simple indulgence, food. Charlotte's face with a table loaded with sweets, candies, cakes, and sweet and alcoholic beverages. The girl's appalled since a dinner of just sweets isn't a balanced diet. Alan expected that reaction but realizes from chatting that the royal family didn't feed her well. Though she was seen as part of the family outside, indoors she was treated like a servant. Seeing the girl unwilling to dine on sweets because she deems it bad, Alan decides to manipulate her into compliance, saying she works for him and must listen. Then he pushes a slice of cake towards her to try and enjoy. Charlotte insists he eats first, and she'll have the leftovers, but Alan explains he doesn't like sweets, he bought it all for her, to make her happy. Hearing someone cares about her and wants to make her happy, and also seeing someone give her something just for her and not as leftovers, Charlotte blushes. Tasting the first bite, Charlotte's overwhelmed with tears because she can't believe someone wants to make her happy after so much mistreatment and doesn't think she deserves it. Alan assures her this is just the beginning and from now on, he'll treat her to the finest delicacies and show her the world to make her the happiest person ever. Charlotte asks why he's doing all this for a stranger, and he admits he's not sure why, but once he gets something in his head, he can't shake it, so she'll just have to deal with it. Then Charlotte insists he join her in eating sweets, and Alan enjoys the taste of cake for the first time in a long while. In the forest, someone watches and realizes they've finally found the demon they've been seeking. After witnessing Charlotte's sheer delight over a few cakes, Alan decides it's time to truly unveil the world's whims to her. Crossing paths with her wasn't just another day at the office, it handed him a brand new mission. But Chow alone won't cut it, now he's gotta figure out what other never before had experiences he can give Charlotte. So, he spends the entire night jotting down ideas in his notebook, and after hours of brainstorming, he compiles a hefty list of new experiences for Charlotte. Among the list are summoning heaps of fluffy monsters for unlimited cuddles, 
crafting magical gear with all sorts of rare materials. And a few that seem more for Alan's benefit than Charlotte's, like turning the lives of anyone opposing Alan into a living nightmare. After giving it a good read, the demon realizes these joys would only tickle his fancy, not necessarily Charlotte's. Deciding he needs to rethink his plan to make Charlotte happy, Alan bumps into her in the hallway, broom in hand, ready to tackle the day's cleaning tasks. Charlotte notices Alan's pulled an all-nighter and tells him he needs to catch some Z's. Alan says he'll crash for a bit and asks her to wake him for lunch, questioning what she plans to clean since she's already scrubbed everything he asked for. Charlotte says she'll tidy up the mansion's entrance and admits she likes cleaning because she feels indebted to him. Alan, wanting to ease her mind, tells her she can go ahead, but it's no rush, and she replies it's just habit since she always started her cleaning duties at the crack of dawn back at the mansion. Hearing this, Alan's thoughts darken on how poorly Charlotte was treated back at the mansion, worse than a servant, and exiled for a crime she didn't commit. Despite it all, Charlotte never badmouths them or vents about her ordeal. This only fuels Alan's anger towards those who caused such harm to such a good and innocent soul. His brooding is cut short by a female voice greeting Charlotte from the mansion's entrance. Worried, Alan hurries over, only to find Mia Cha, the mail delivery catwoman hybrid. Mia Cha teases Alan about having enough dough to hire a maid and calls him a demon, sparking panic in Charlotte, though Alan assures it's just an expression. Then, Mia Cha drops that she knows Charlotte's the exile from Maruz, sending Charlotte into a panic attack, frozen stiff, fearing her end has come. Alan scrambles for an excuse, but draws a blank. Luckily, Mia Cha says she'll keep mum because the delivery company prioritizes clients over meddling in their lives, plus they've got no ties to the kingdom to aid them. Later, Alan hands Mia Cha a box of potions to sell in town. She remarks if she lived there, she'd make a killing because his potions are top-notch and in high demand. Hearing this, Alan's mood darkens, stating the city's too crowded for his liking. Mia Cha points out that's why they call him a demon in town, saddening Alan, though he knows it's true. Reality is, he's just a solitary mage, but rumors pegged him as a vile demon, drawing adventurers to the forest even though he prefers solitude. Despite the nickname, Alan's a good guy who can't help but aid those in need, a fact well known by Mia Cha and Charlotte. Changing the subject, Alan asks Mia Cha to show them catalogs so they can order stuff, insisting Charlotte pick whatever she wants, though he's already ordered a bunch for her, knowing she's too modest to ask. In a chat with Mia Cha, stress comes up, sparking the next indulgence Alan plans to introduce to Charlotte. A few days later, Mia Cha returns with their orders. Showing affection for Charlotte, she hands over the packages. The first is for Charlotte, a bag the size of a purse containing all her requests. Alan's order, however, is a tad larger. A humongous box nearly reaching the first floor ceiling and taking up a good chunk of the living room. That too is for Charlotte. She eyes the massive object with fear, clueless about what Alan ordered for her. Upon opening it, she finds a top-quality punching bag. Assuming it's for physical exercise, Charlotte's baffled, but Alan has a different idea in mind. After handing her boxing gloves, he sticks a photo of her former fiancé on the bag. Charlotte's too polite for such actions, but Alan explains she shouldn't just accept her past treatment and has every right to be angry. However, Charlotte insists she's not mad, reasoning the prince must have had his reasons for mistreating her, trampling her dignity, framing her for crimes, and exiling her. Despite Alan highlighting all the harm done to her, Charlotte claims she can't be mad at them since they raised her and she owes them, even pitying the prince for being engaged to her initially. Alan worries Charlotte's guilt runs deeper than he thought, foiling his plan for her to realize her hatred towards that family, confront the kingdom, expose the prince's wrongdoings, prove her innocence, and catch the baddies. A tad naive for someone dubbed a demon, but hey, it's the thought that counts. Her wounds and suppressed feelings are too profound. So, Alan shifts gears, telling Charlotte if she doesn't want to hit the bag, she can hit him. Naturally, Charlotte refuses, 
but Alan's not up for debate. Casting magic on the boxing glove, he forces her to punch him, knocking the poor mage to the ground. Basically, he punched himself, while Mia Cha and Charlotte are horrified, not quite grasping what just happened. Then Alan explains, no matter how much she hits, stomps, or humiliates him, he'll never abandon her. He'll always be by her side, unlike her former home. Here, she's free to do and say as she pleases. Charlotte's moved by the word free for the first time in her life but still gets mad at Alan for forcing her to hit him to say that. She earnestly asks him never to make her do something like that again because she couldn't bear it. Alan promises he will, then softens seeing Charlotte's new outlook on life, noting she used to worry about many things but now, by his side, she realizes there's no need. From afar, in a tree facing the mansion, the girl who's been watching from a distance finally steps forward, right in front of the demon's house she's been searching for so long. After reminding Charlotte that she's now free to choose whatever she wants, whenever she wants, without facing major consequences, Alan starts off with the simple stuff. He offers her tea or coffee for breakfast, and Charlotte, ever adaptable, goes with whatever Alan chooses. The demon claims he'll be drinking a disgusting concoction, leaving Charlotte no choice but to make her own pick, she opts for tea. Charlotte confesses that the first time she made a decision on her own was when she decided to flee the kingdom, so choosing between tea or coffee doesn't seem like a big deal to her. Surprised, Alan asks what new thing she'd like to try so they can get started, but their chat is interrupted as the girl who's been watching them for a while now crashes in through the window. Unfazed, Alan asks her how she found him and what she's doing here. The girl tells them she tracked the pollen from a letter and easily located the mansion. Yeah, I don't get it either. But hey, that's how things roll in this world, it seems. Anyway, she introduces herself to Charlotte as Aruka, a magical engineering apprentice and Alan's younger sister. The demon clarifies she's actually his stepsister. When he was little and orphaned, Aruka's family took him in and raised him as their own son. Following this, Aruka, who's the same age as Charlotte, inquires about who Charlotte is, thinking they look like a couple. In sync, the exile and Alan clarify they're not dating, with Alan launching into a spiel about how he'd never match someone as wonderful as Charlotte with a grumpy, solitary mage like himself, though Charlotte insists she'd never think that of herself. They then spill the beans about Charlotte's exile, how they met, etc. Iruka ends up thinking her brother, or well, stepbrother, is a huge idiot. Letting Charlotte taste new foods and hitting him to release stress isn't enough, he needs to think of specific things that could make a woman happy. So, she decides she'll take charge of introducing Charlotte to new whims. Even though she came to bring Alan back home, her mission has changed. Now, she wants to make the exiled girl happy, using her womanly skills. Alan insists no one's better than him at showing whims since that's pretty much all he thinks about, but Aruka counters that only a girl knows what another girl wants. Eventually, they decide to have a whims competition, where each will show new whims to Charlotte, and she'll choose. So, the trio heads to town, and Alan casts a spell to change Charlotte's hair so she won't be recognized. However, Aruka takes the lead, and once camouflaged, they head to a clothing store. The first essential whim for any woman, according to her, is developing a taste for fashion. While the girls have fun, Alan feels out of place but can't bail in the middle of a duel, so he sticks around. This duel with his sister reminds him of their chess matches when he was adopted. Iruko would constantly challenge him to chess, and he'd always lose, but he never stopped trying. Alan thinks this new whims duel is her way of reconnecting with him after being distant for so long. As Charlotte tries on some outfits, the siblings chat. Alan asks Iruka to dig up dirt in the kingdom of Nera's, public opinion on Charlotte, the image they have of her, street talk but nothing on the prince and his family yet, because finding out will make him want to torch the kingdom, and he's still playing it cool. Their chat is cut short when Charlotte needs Aruka's help zipping up a backless blouse. As Aruka moves to assist, she notices something horrific. Later, in front of Alan, she points out Charlotte's backless attire, and then the demon also sees it, Charlotte's back is covered in whip scars, clearly inflicted to instill fear and pain. Charlotte seems unaware of her body's scars, hence her enjoyment of the backless blouse. Alan uses his magic to erase the scars, and a deep rage starts to brew within him. Treating her like a servant was bad enough, but this, this crosses a line. He assures Iruka they'll no longer hold back against the kingdom, they must destroy it. Iruka agrees, feeling the same. After buying heaps of clothes, it's Alan's turn. He takes her all over town, 
telling her to buy whatever she wants, to teach her how stress-relieving spending money can be. By the end, Charlotte is surrounded by shopping bags, feeling guilty about the expenditure, but both assure her it's part of learning to be happy. Alan realizes he's lost to Aruka and wants to try something else. So, he heads to a jewelry stall and buys Charlotte a hair jewel matching her eye color. Before Charlotte can express her gratitude for the lovely gift, two brutes bump into them, demanding to spend the night with Charlotte as compensation for their disrespect. Alan had promised Charlotte no fighting, as she dislikes violence, but he can't stay in the men's disrespect and starts throwing punches. To the townsfolk's awe, Alan floors one man. The second man, wielding a magical fire sword, seems like a threat, but Alan easily freezes the sword with his magic and knocks him down too. The townsfolk cheer, having long suffered the bully's abuse. Alan blushes, then apologizes to Charlotte for resorting to violence, though she excitedly thanks him for defending her. As she grabs his hands, Alan's surprised but happy about Charlotte warming up to him. Iruka sees a budding romance but knows not all is rosy as the situation suddenly worsens. Behind Alan appears a giant creature, ready to destroy him for humiliating his boys. So, they're about to throw down, and this giant stone dude is all set to obliterate Alan, but Alan isn't even sweating it, despite Charlotte pleading with him to be careful from behind. Alan walks up to the stone behemoth and, all chill-like, asks if it happens to be Megath. Megath is taken aback that Alan knows his name, and Alan keeps pushing, insisting they've met before, like seven years ago, trying to slap some friendly pats on the beast, which just ticks it off more. When Megath shoves him back, Alan switches gears to a more no-nonsense vibe and mentions it's weird Megath doesn't remember him from magic school. Then it clicks for Megath that he's facing the big bad demon, and he drops to his knees to apologize. Behind him, Megatha's cronies are egging him on to whack Alan since they reckon he can easily dust the so-called weakling Alan, but Megath isn't having it and shoves them to the ground. Then Aruka chimes in that their dad runs the magic academy they all attended as kids. Megath apologizes again, and Alan's like, I didn't even do anything, which gives him a glimmer of hope that maybe things will be alright. But his goons did hassle, and when Alan has to clarify what Charlotte is to him, he hesitates because clearly, she's more than just a guest, so he ends up saying she's the woman he cherishes. Another day, Aruka and the cat girl find Alan looking all down in the dumps at the house's entrance, guessing it's gotta be about Charlotte since she's the only thing that could get him like this. Alan spills that he had to convince Charlotte to let him pay her for all her work around the house. But the real kicker isn't that, it's that Charlotte decided she'd buy something in town with the money, on her own, cause it's a secret. This stings Alan cause it means she's gaining more independence, but still, he uses his magic to tweak her looks a bit so she blends in with the townsfolk, though he's worried sick about her being alone in town. The girl says spying on Charlotte while she does her secret shopping is a no-brainer, so off they go to town to keep a watchful eye from a distance. They see Charlotte navigating with a map but she's kind of messing it up and getting lost. The cat girl warns if Charlotte keeps heading that way, she'll end up in the roughest part of town, run by a gang of thugs, so they better step in. But Alan's not about to spoil Charlotte's first solo adventure, so he darts off ahead. Before Charlotte can stumble into the thug-infested area, Alan goes ahead and roughs up the thugs so when Charlotte arrives, she's met with a bunch of bruised thugs who treat her like royalty, asking if she needs anything. Charlotte sees they're all beat up and offers them magical potions to heal, making the thugs think of her as some kind of benevolent goddess. They ask how she's connected to the great demon. She shares her story, skipping the bits about being a princess, saying Alan's her lord, which Alan isn't thrilled about, though he kinda is. Then, to a bunch of puzzled thugs, she clarifies she's not under threat from Alan, despite his spooky vibe, he's actually a top-notch guy. After bidding farewell, Charlotte continues her journey, but as she delves deeper into the neighborhood, it gets more dangerous. So, following his earlier tactic, Alan goes around clobbering every group of thugs, including werewolves and puppeteers, ensuring Charlotte's treated nicely wherever she goes. After taking down all potential troublemakers for Charlotte, there's no point in tailing her anymore, though Alan's dying to know what her secret purchase is. Mia Cha takes over the tailing to give Charlotte some space. Eventually, Charlotte's done shopping and meets up with our gang on her way home, accompanied by a vendor thanking Alan for making the town safer by knocking out many baddies and convincing others to turn over a new leaf. 
Alan's taken aback that his actions to protect and care for Charlotte positively influenced others and helped them. The vendor tells Charlotte she's picked a good boyfriend, causing a bit of a fluster between them as they quickly deny it. Then Charlotte shows off her purchases, gifts for Mia Cha the cat girl, and for Aruka. Both are thrilled, and Alan's a tad jealous he didn't get anything. Charlotte says she looked for something for him but wasn't sure what he liked, so she didn't buy anything. Alan admits anything from her would be enough, even a worm. Charlotte reveals she noticed his cloak was fraying and thought sewing it up would be a nice gift for everything he does for her, while also hinting at Alan to share his likes for future gift ideas. At that moment, Alan realizes something new is happening inside him because every moment with Charlotte feels like the most important of his life. Alan's lent Charlotte a book on the country's history, and she's all buzz about it. One day, she tells Alan she's dug into their old magic school and found loads about the country she loves. Alan's like, let's hit the road, pick a spot, but Charlotte's all about not indulging in whims too much, or she'll turn into a diva, which apparently ain't cool. Alan, playing it cool, ends up swaying her for a trip to her top pick. Then, out of nowhere, Mia Cha pops in with an oddly timed visit, nighttime and all, dropping off a letter for a free trip for two to Yanoha. With no other plans, Alan and Charlotte set off to Yanoha, with Charlotte stoked about heading somewhere so dreamy. But as they soak in the scenery, two shady dudes on horses are eyeing them from afar with not-so-nice intentions. Charlotte reminisces about a sneaky carriage ride in Nara's but regrets not seeing much since she was hiding. She wonders if Aruka should have joined them, but Alan's tight-lipped about his side quest in Nara's. Turns out, the horseback watchers are none other than Miacha and Aruka, scheming to see if sparks fly between Alan and Charlotte because it's obvious they're into each other but need a nudge. On the carriage, Alan probes if this is where Charlotte wanted to go. She nods, but Alan smells a lie. Charlotte admits she's embarrassed because it's a kitty spot. Alan reassures her it's cool to catch up on Miss Childhood Fun, calming her nerves. At the hotel, the receptionist is thrilled to host them for their honeymoon, but they're quick to correct her, blushing, that they're not a couple. She explains their package is for couples, and Alan, realizing Miacha's matchmaking, opts for the couple's package, making Charlotte blush. They're served a giant cocktail meant for two, but Alan downs it solo to dodge an awkward moment. Then, it's hot springtime. Alan's mentally prepping to see Charlotte in a swimsuit, but when she shows up, his heart skips a beat, in a totally wholesome way, promise. They spend the day with massages, water gun fights, and as the sun sets, Alan introduces Charlotte to the luxury of eating ice cream in the hot springs. Using a spell to keep the ice cream cold, soon everyone wants in, and Alan's magic boosts ice cream sales, earning them special treatment from the resort. Among the perks, they mention a magical animal zoo. Charlotte's eyes light up, and Alan set on making that their next adventure. That night, they're awkward about sharing a bed but decide to because it's enchanted for dreamful sleep. Charlotte wants to dream of her late mom, like in her childhood, but struggles to fall asleep. Alan casts a sleep spell on her, then, captivated by her peaceful face, uses the spell on himself too. Alan and Charlotte hit up the magical animal zoo, with Charlotte feeling a tad guilty for imposing her preferences on Alan. However, Alan is all in, promising to buy her anything she desires. Upon reaching the pet-friendly zone, Alan's surprised to find capybaras, known for their feisty nature. Yet, a caretaker reassures him that only peace-loving creatures reside here. When Alan returns to Charlotte's side, he finds her moved to tears with gratitude for the experience. Later, Alan chats up the magical critters, convincing them to frolic with Charlotte in exchange for some carrots. But, turning around, Alan's stunned to see all animals congregated around Charlotte like she's some kind of Snow White, leaving the onlookers in awe. This magical moment reminds Alan of when he first stumbled upon Charlotte in the forest, tended to by woodland creatures. Alan then hints at the myriad of magic and innate abilities, suspecting Charlotte has a knack for taming magical creatures. As he elaborates, a caretaker who witnessed their animal whispering skills seeks their help with a dire situation. They're led to a secluded area where everyone recognizes Alan, thanks to his dad. They're shown a cage housing a Fenrir, a noble and peaceful magical creature, now agitated and hurt. The Fenrir was separated from its parents and injured by a poacher. Given their endangered status, it's illegal to hunt them, but their bones and fur are highly sought after for magical gear. 
The caretakers wish to communicate with the Fenrir to aid its recovery, but even Alan's high-level magic only earns a fierce growl in response. The situation worsens when they learn the Fenrir's mother, sensing her injured offspring, is on her way, potentially ready to wreak havoc. Determined to reason with the mother, Alan advises an evacuation while Charlotte, inspired by Alan's belief in her animal-taming gift, requests to speak with the Fenrir pup. Despite initial doubts, Alan relents, realizing they're short on options. Meanwhile, Alan teams up with Aruka and Mia Cha, prepping a barrier around the town and freezing young Fenrirs. But facing the mother Fenrir proves challenging, and an infernal capybara intervenes, claiming it's there to save Charlotte. The capybara, having followed Charlotte since their first forest encounter, plans to eliminate Alan as part of its rescue mission. Amid their clash, Charlotte arrives with the healed Fenrir and a host of animals, sharing the truth she learned, which she now shares with the rest to prevent further conflict. Despite the capybara's initial refusal to back down, it eventually concedes, realizing its love for Charlotte and that it can't match Alan's power. With the crisis averted, our heroes leave the hotel, but not before the Fenrirs show up to bid Charlotte farewell. The Fenrir decides to ditch its mom and move in with our heroes, despite some doubts about its ability to stay away from mom. But the receptionist drops a fact bomb. The Fenrir can zip from Alan's mansion to their current spot in an hour, convincing everyone to welcome the new family member. Charlotte's feeling a bit guilty about Alan hosting not just her, but now a Fenrir too. Alan, however, warmly welcomes the idea of expanding the family, which prompts Charlotte to ask if she's considered family. Alan says yes, and as he holds her hands, it almost feels like he's popping the question, leading Charlotte blushing. On their way back, the capybara decides to join the gang as Charlotte's bodyguard. When Charlotte queries about its origins, the capybara dodges with a joke instead of the backstory it shared with Alan. Post-resort, Charlotte reveals her dream to become a magical creature tamer, which delights Alan. He sees her growth from the day she was counting with grains to now. Alan pledges to teach her all there is about taming. Despite enjoying Charlotte's progress, Alan feels a tad blue, missing their time together as Charlotte now devotes much of her time to the Fenrir, leaving less room for Alan to introduce her to new whims. The capybara teases Alan, suggesting he's fallen for Charlotte, a notion Alan swiftly denies. After Charlotte showcases her taming skills, Alan attempts to pet the Fenrir, only to be met with a growl, making it clear the creature trusts only Charlotte. The capybara mentions Charlotte might have reached beast conversation level, allowing her to communicate with animals in human language. Alan, intrigued, vows to assist her in mastering this skill. They wonder how the capybara can speak human language, to which it claims to be self-taught, prompting them to drop the subject. Eventually, Charlotte successfully converses with the Fenrir in human tongue, exposing its disdain for Alan. To celebrate her achievement, Alan conjures a pool for the Fenrir, and when the capybara tries to join, denied entry, it transforms into a woman using magic. While enjoying the pool, mysterious mushrooms sprout, bewildering everyone. Suddenly, Dorothea Grimm Wallenstein emerges, annoyed at the theft of her mushrooms. It's revealed she's the Dark Elf who vanished 30 years ago, explaining the mansion's low price. Shocked to learn three decades have passed, Dorothea takes the news well, meeting the magical residents without fuss. Alan worries about legal issues now that Dorothea, the original owner, is back. He offers to buy the mansion, which Dorothea agrees to, not for money, but for help with a problem. She needs inspiration for a romance novel, having hidden away after failing to write one. Reluctantly, Alan agrees to help, spurred on by Charlotte. Dorothea needs them to get cozy as muse for her romance writing, a task that Alan finds awkward but is something Charlotte convinces him to do for the sake of helping Dorothea out. So, Alan and Charlotte vow to help Dorothea pen her romance novel, which means acting out a lovey-dovey play, think Romeo and Juliet but with less poison and more floating. When Alan's supposed to sweep Charlotte off her feet, he opts for magic levitation instead of the classic Prince Carey, irking Dorothea who can't believe a grown man is shy about lifting a lady. Dorothea, peeved, demands they stick to the script since they can't flirt to save their lives. She even skipped the kissing scenes to spare them the awkwardness. Alan, pondering the worth of his dignity versus the mansion, initially refuses to continue. He bets Charlotte wouldn't want to pretend to be in love with a guy she's not into, but Charlotte timidly admits it wouldn't bother her if it's with him. This revelation sends Alan headfirst into a wall, creating a sizable dent. 
After some healing from Charlotte, Alan agrees to get back into character, as long as it doesn't clash with his morals. Dorothea is thrilled by their natural flirting but realizes at their snail's pace she'll never finish her book. Next up in their acting gig, they play a married couple. Alan's heart skips a beat seeing Charlotte dressed as his wife, leading to a nosebleed when she asks a risque question from the script. Dinner scenes turn disastrous with Alan bleeding out from Charlotte's cutesy nickname for him. With the married life act bombing, Dorothea switches settings to high school, introducing the capybara, in woman form, and the femur into the mix. Alan's the bad boy whose childhood friend, played by Charlotte, gets kidnapped by capybara and Fenrir. The fight gets too real, with capybara landing extra hits on Alan. Seeing Charlotte's tied up hands, Alan's rage takes over, almost forgetting it's all an act. He knocks out capybara and Fenrir and rushes to Charlotte's rescue. Remembering his real-life heroics in the shop, Alan realizes his feelings for Charlotte are complicated. Off script, Alan corners Charlotte and upon seeing her up close, feels his heart racing again. Capybara questions Alan's feelings for Charlotte, but Alan breaks away from the script, declaring himself her guardian. Later, Alan admits he can never confess his true feelings, fearing Charlotte's kindness would oblige her to reciprocate. They move on to a Cinderella scene, and Charlotte, while cleaning, recalls her life before Alan. Dancing with Alan, dressed as a prince, Charlotte's heart races, and she leans her head on his chest, making Alan blush. In the climactic scene, Charlotte, feeling the moment's intensity, improvises and asks Alan about his true feelings for her. But before he can answer, an explosion rips through the wall. A man barges in, claiming he's there for Dorothea, sensing her presence after 30 years. He's her editor, here to drag her back, offering Alan compensation for the damaged mansion before leaving. Choosing to ignore the almost confession, Aruka rushes in with urgent news, Charlotte's sister, Natalia, is in deep trouble. Charlotte reminisces about her harsh life at the Evans mansion, treated worse than a maid. One day, her younger sister Natalia, then just a kid, approached her with some ointment for her worn out hands, expressing a wish to grow closer, breaking the formal barrier between them. From that day, despite the family's differing attitudes, the two sisters formed a strong bond. Fast forward to the present, our gang heads to an island housing the Magical Academy where Alan and Aruka once studied, seeking Natalia, who's reportedly in trouble and all alone. Charlotte panics at the thought of meeting Alan's parents unprepared. But Alan, who's been estranged from the Academy and his family since a dramatic exit three years ago, faces his own set of worries. Iruka hints at the infamous sky-high mage duel between Alan and his father that lasted three days, a family feud that's still the talk of the town. Despite his adoption and complicated family dynamics, Alan downplays the conflict, trying to comfort Charlotte, who frets about the trouble her disappearance might have caused Natalia. Upon arrival, a gray-haired man swiftly breaks up a fight with his freezing magic, reminding Charlotte of Alan. He introduces himself as Aruka and Alan's father, mistaking Charlotte for Alan's girlfriend. Aruka's signals and a bit of improv from Charlotte keep up the girlfriend facade, to Alan's dad's delight, who hints at marriage as a way for Alan to settle down. Despite the awkwardness and Alan's reluctance to follow in his father's footsteps as the Academy's director, the conversation shifts to Natalia. They learn she's been at the Academy for three months, seeking refuge from family troubles under the guise of studying abroad. Viewing a magical projection, they see Natalia surrounded by older students, not as a victim but as a domineering figure, treating them almost like slaves with a mix of arrogance and benevolence, showing her complexity by financially supporting those in need. Resolved to handle the Natalia situation, Alan plans to approach her disguised as his assistant, with Charlotte playing along. That night, Alan's mother prepares a room for them, further entangling them in the couple lie. Alan and Charlotte feel awkward about having to share a bed since they're supposedly a couple. Alan decides to use his magic to put both himself and Charlotte to sleep to bypass the awkward moment, but it doesn't work, and he realizes they're on a bed with anti-magic properties. Behind the wall, Aruka claims she won't make the same mistake she did on the trip she gifted them, as everything she does is aimed at getting the two lovebirds together. Unable to sleep, they start talking, and Charlotte takes the opportunity to ask Alan what he was about to tell her at the end of Dorothea's performance, before they got interrupted. Alan starts to think about all the beautiful things he could say and his desires for a life together with her. However, he doesn't want to impose his dreams on Charlotte. 
For her part, Charlotte also thinks she'd like to continue sharing her life with him, but then remembers she's just a fugitive and doesn't have the right to dream about such things since it would only burden Alan. So, before Alan can respond, she says she didn't mean to make him uncomfortable and decides to sleep, ending the conversation there. The next day, Alan and Charlotte, transformed into his assistant, head to the academy. There, Alan introduces himself to Natalia, who immediately takes a combative stance. Alan presents himself as a substitute teacher and upon saying his name, Natalia's bodyguards or classmates, it's unclear which, tell her he's the biggest troublemaker in the academy's history. Alan explains he's there to deal with other troublemakers like her as their instructor, but receives a totally hostile treatment from Natalia and then leaves. That day, Alan and Charlotte attend Natalia's class and sit next to her. Alan realizes that despite being at the academy for only three months, she knows a lot about magic and even corrects the teacher. He uses this opportunity to ask her to teach magic to his assistant. Natalia is reluctant but agrees upon seeing the assistant's enthusiasm. Later, Charlotte thanks her for teaching her magic and tells Natalia she wants to learn so she won't depend on Alan or anyone else for protection. Then, a capybara and a Fenrir appear to bring them lunch, and they share a tender moment with Charlotte, drawing the attention of the entire school. Later, Natalia asks why she needs magic if she can tame magical animals like an infernal capybara and a Fenrir, but she downplays her power. She then decides to go get a salad for Natalia so she can have a healthier lunch than her usual burger. Natalia is surprised by her care, given they hardly know each other. She then asks Alan if he was sent by her parents, and when he denies it, she starts badmouthing her family. Alan asks if her diligent studying is to get away from her family, and she confirms it's one of the reasons. Alan mentions Charlotte's news, and Natalia, infuriated, tells him never to bring up that topic in front of her again. Fortunately, Charlotte continues searching for Salad, so she doesn't hear this. Then, a teenager named Chris challenges Natalia as they seem to be enemies. Natalia lets him go without further ado, but later, when Charlotte is mistreated, Natalia can't stand seeing her treated badly and hits two of Chris's bullies. Alan tells her they shouldn't fight in the cafeteria and then creates a subdimensional world, teaching Natalia the three basic rules of fighting, demonstrating why he's always called the Great Demon, as hatred and darkness are visible in his aura. Just as he's about to break the spirits of the bullies, Charlotte uses the lightning magic she learned that day to stop the attack and tells Alan he shouldn't fight unless it's necessary. After a scolding from Charlotte about not fighting, Alan and Natalia talk, and Alan shares that he knows her past. He started fighting to defend the marginalized until he formed his own group, earning the hatred of many, so now he has no choice but to defend himself. But he can't keep fighting all the time, and Natalia says he shouldn't advise her to get along with them. Instead, Alan tells her she needs to improve and become the sovereign of the entire academy, with a completely dark aura as he says it. Iruka arrives at the scene where Alan is with Natalia and Charlotte, introducing herself as the younger sister of the great demon, which excites Natalia. There, Iruka finds out that her plan for Alan to lead her on the right path isn't working, as at that very moment, Alan is teaching the girl how to conquer the academy, which basically involves challenging the strongest enemy and crushing them. Iruka and Charlotte are worried since Alan's evilness is transferring to Natalia too quickly. That afternoon, Natalia defeats one of her enemies, and her subordinates also managed to beat those who were bothering them, thanks to the teachings of the Infernal Capybara, who treats them almost like soldiers, but at least teaches them to defend themselves so they don't depend too much on Natalia. Then, Charlotte hears Natalia's stomach growling and offers to go to lunch. The two girls share a table while the Crawford brothers watch them. Even though she hates vegetables, Natalia decides to eat all the vegetable dishes Charlotte offers her just to make her happy. Later, she proposes to teach her a new spell just because she wants to spend time with her. Meanwhile, Alan tells Aruka that he hasn't yet told Natalia the truth about his assistant, because he has noticed that Charlotte is a topic that bothers her. That night, Natalia falls asleep, and our protagonists decide to take her to her room to sleep peacefully. Upon arriving, they realize that her room is full of books and notes, showing how hard she works to be the way she is. Then, they see a suitcase full of locks, and using magic, Alan finds out it's sealed with biometric magic, and if someone tried to open it, a trap would be activated. At that moment, 
Chris appears at Natalia's door but leaves when he sees there are too many people. Charlotte decides to continue hiding her identity because she believes if Natalia knew who she really was, everything would be ruined. The next day, the Evan sisters gather for a magic class, and Natalia is surprised by how quickly Charlotte learns. After spending a lovely day together, she tells her it reminded her of the good times before the academy and decides to show her the suitcase. However, when they head to Natalia's room, she becomes desperate upon seeing that the suitcase she cares so much about has disappeared. Then, on the table, she finds a dual letter from Chris, telling her that if she wants to get her suitcase back, they must face each other. Natalia decides to do it and asks Charlotte not to say anything, then leaves. Later, her subordinates, Alan, and the magical animals tirelessly search for Natalia but without much success. Then, one of Chris's subordinates appears, completely horrified, asking for help because Chris has made Natalia go to the location of the Forbidden Dungeon just at a time when the owner is disturbed. Alan decides to go save the kids by himself and asks the capybara to notify his father. In the dungeon, Natalia and Chris face off to see who gets to the suitcase first, which is at the bottom of the dungeon, and Natalia manages to beat him as she has all the times they've faced off since she's been there. Then, a gigantic, highly disturbed chimera appears, terrifying them. Chris quickly flees, and then the two hide. But quickly, the chimera finds them again and pushes Chris, leaving him unconscious, while Natalia falls but remains conscious. When Natalia sees a gigantic goat's hoof over her, about to end her life, she is saved by a very loud power, as the noise scares away chimeras. As the light and smoke from the power dissipate, she realizes it's Charlotte, well, the assistant, who has saved her. Then she asks why she saved her, and Charlotte explains that despite being good with magic, she's still a little girl and can't do those kinds of things alone. Natalia refers to the fact that inside the suitcase are memories of her older sister. The Evans sisters continue their conversation about the suitcase, and Natalia tearfully tells the assistant that she had an older sister who was unjustly accused, leading their family to cut ties with her. This is why Natalia is angry with her family and herself for not being able to save her sister. She then states she's looking for the man who has imprisoned her sister, intending to tear him apart, which is why she needs to become stronger. Chris, having overheard the entire story, apologizes for being so cruel without understanding the significance of the suitcase to her. Then, a beast even worse than the chimera, Salamander, the owner of the place, appears. Charlotte tells the children to run and find Alan while she defends them, but with a single attack, she is thrown to the ground, breaking her transformation spell. Then, Natalia realizes that the assistant was her sister all along. When Salamander is about to deliver the final blow, Alan appears and uses a great power that shakes the island and frightens the children, but he finally manages to tame the beast with some affection, as he was the one who raised it when they were young. In the end, once everyone is calmer and out of the dungeon, Charlotte wakes up from the blow, and the Evans sisters have an emotional reunion. Natalia opens the suitcase and asks Charlotte to read her the story she used to read when they were girls again. With Natalia's problem resolved, our protagonists return to the mansion and their usual peace. Then they circle back to their conversation about feelings, and when they finally decide to talk, Mia Cha delivers a package containing an indication circle. When activated, Natalia makes a surprise visit to her sister and Alan. After the joy of seeing each other and the fights between Master and Disciple Alan and Natalia, Dorothea arrives to bring them her new novel, which only took her 30 years. Dorothea asks for their help again as the editor is asking for a sequel, and although Alan clearly doesn't want to help, everyone insists until he agrees. That night, Charlotte has a nightmare about her old times in the Evans mansion and, waking up to see Alan is awake, asks if she can be with him. Alan decides to show her one of the best nighttime whims and so they light several lanterns, prepare chocolate with marshmallows, and watch the stars. While watching the stars, Alan accidentally touches Charlotte's hand, and blushing, they hold hands. As they thank each other for everything they've done for one another, they are about to share their first kiss, but then they are interrupted by all the other characters who are there watching them, which seems a bit perverse to hide and watch two people kiss, but I won't say anything. The point is, they don't get to kiss. Meanwhile, in the kingdom of Neras, the subordinates inform the prince that they have found Charlotte, and the prince orders her capture, with twisted ideas in his mind. And so ends for now this anime that has created so many emotions. I hope the answers won't be long in coming in future episodes, so if you like this series, let me know in the comments. 
For my part, I say goodbye until next time, always reminding you that it's always time to subscribe to my channel and be part of this wonderful community. Until next time.